and I heard the doctor say to him, don't go, he's probably not going to make it. And in that moment, it was almost as if everything switched off. Like when you pull the cord on an old TV, you know, those CRT TVs, the whole thing goes, powers down, everything powered down in a sort of way. And then suddenly, just as suddenly, everything came back online again. But things were very different. Welcome to Men This Way. The podcast for every man who seeks to live his deepest purpose in life, who's committed to showing up fully and giving his unique gifts to the world. Because if not you, then who? I'm your host and fellow journeyman, Brian Reeves. Brian with a Y, Reeves. Men, this way. What is the point of meditation? Are intimate relationships always going to feel burdensome? How can we men ever experience true freedom amidst life's endless challenges? In this episode, my guest, Steve James, also known as Guru Viking, and I give you useful answers to these questions and more. I've known Steve personally for a few years. He's been my teacher, my coach, And as a man, I just really like being around. I'm going to claim him as my friend, too. Now, I've led an extraordinary life, but I'm envious of Steve's extraordinary life. Growing up on the windswept Shetland Islands off the northernmost coast of Scotland, in his teens, Steve was apprenticed to a Christian mystic from the Celtic tradition of Christianity, which launched him into years of deep personal inquiry and practice around various forms of prayer, contemplation, textual study, and service. Much like mine, Steve's path of investigating the human experience is through his own direct experience. He's explored the limits of physical and psychological performance through his fascination with extreme outdoor survival expeditions, including Arctic training in the boreal forests of northern Sweden, where daytime temperatures reach highs of only minus 24 degrees Celsius. When I learned that Steve had also toured internationally as a guitarist and musical director with multiple number one best-selling pop artists out of the UK, well, I found the parallel to my own former life as an indie band manager both curious and delightful. There's just so much more I could say about Steve's life experiences. I feel very much a kindred spirit with this man, whom one of his many fans described as the human fiery bearded reincarnation of Yoda. And he does totally have a Yoda with a British accent thing going on. Steve's work is full of the embrace of paradox, which I've discovered is an essential practice on the quest to living a truly masterful life. For not just surviving, but actually thriving in intimate relationship. And for simply feeling alive. We talk about the living practice of paradox and more in this episode of Men This Way. Let's dive. Steve James, welcome. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for having me on. It is such an honor to have you here, Steve. In the few years that I have been able to work with you, study with you, go to your workshops, and even even coach with you, you have gifted me so much. And it is such an honor to be able to share you and your insights and wisdom. All of them, Steve. We want all of them today with uh, with my audience. Thank you, Brian. Yeah. It's been a real pleasure these years. So, so Steve, let's, uh, I want to just dive right in with just a little icebreaker question, because I know that you live on a, a very narrow boat in England. Is that right? Yeah. In fact, you're on it right now, aren't you? That's right. I am. I am on it right now. Yes. Right now, where outside of London, we won't give your exact location to <laughs> protect the innocent. Yeah. If you if you go to London and then go north, okay. if you're meant to find me, you will find me. <laughs> oh, I like that. <laughs> if you're yeah. meant to find but, me, I like um, that. Yeah, it's fifty nine foot long and six foot ten wide and twenty tons in weight. So they call them narrow boats here, and they're designed to cruise the canal system 
in the UK, before we had railways and things like that, all the goods were transported, a lot of them, by canal. These mm. sort of, uh, you know, not rivers, really. They're smaller than rivers. Man-made yeah. water railways, really. And so they had these long boats. Now there isn't much goods really transported on these things, so they're used for living on. So, yeah. So just Steve James is transported on these things. Yes. It's like a floating library, really. I have coffee and books <laughs> on here. Yeah. It sounds delightful. Yeah. What What is the best part about living on a boat? You know, being in the countryside is wonderful. Being on the water is very nice. Those of your listeners who've ever slept on water, when it's calm anyway, will know it's just mm. so relaxing. It's like being rocked to sleep. <laughs> and there's a funny feeling. When you, you steer these, these narrow boats from the back, you stand on the back and you, uh, you, know, you steer from behind and you look down the entire length of the boat and all your stuff is on there. And there's something quite nice about being able to take all of your stuff somewhere at once and see it all in one place, you know. Mm. So, that's, you know, right. being in the countryside is nice and being able to look and say, there's where all the stuff is in that one place. Mm. It's nice. Okay. What's the most inconvenient? We'll just, we'll language it that way. Inconvenient part about living on a six foot wide boat. Yeah, six foot, ten foot wide boat. Well, the internet is not that great. <laughs> okay. That's the worst part. I used to live in London where, you know, they have sort of, it's practically jacked into your brain. You know, they've got such fast internet there, you know. And so <laughs> living out here on the water, you have to use kind of mobile internet, a little bit like what your cell phone uses. So it's not yeah. quite as uh, fast and instant as it used to be for me in that regard. Uh, but there's, of course, some pros to that as well. You think twice about that sure. 78th YouTube video in a row when, you know, it's going to take you 15 <laughs> minutes just to load the thing. Uh, right. Yeah, that would definitely cut down on my key and peel yeah. uh, indulgences. Yeah. I, I get lost in their rabbit hole quite a bit. Yeah. Steve, your journey through life, and you're younger than me, actually, mm -hmm. your journey. So I've had a very eclectic, I'm very proud of my journey through life. I've you know, been a lot of places and had a lot of different experiences and I'm, I'm grateful. But you have the journey that I would have chosen if someone gave me the choice, so to speak. Oh, really? Because uh -huh. you've done some really extraordinary things. You were mentored by a Christian mystic in the Celtic tradition. And what can dive more? I mean, you grew up in a far north aisle uh, in the Scottish Isles, yeah, right? With no trees. That's right. And, you know, you, you've, done, you've done a lot of uh, uh, very, very cold weather survival training. You know, you've done a lot of, very, you've, you've experienced a lot of very primal experiences is the way that I would define it. But I'd love to hear from you a significant event or experience in your early life that played a fundamental role in shaping you as a man. Yeah, that's quite a question. You don't pull your punches, dear. No. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. We dive in. Yeah, that's great. I was thinking about this question, and I would say... On one occasion, I almost died. I had a sort of near-death experience. And I think that's probably a fairly formative experience. At the time, I was in my early 20s living in London. And I was a musician in the music business uh, mm. a little bit. And so yeah. I'd finished playing a week on Evita, the musical Evita. And I came home after my week in Evita. And, okay, if anyone's squeamish, then... Don't listen for the next five seconds. Mm. You know, I went to the, let's just say I went to the bathroom and an enormous amount of black tar emerged. Very wow. pungent black tar. Now, that's not a good thing. And I thought, you oh. Emerged from where, Steve? Well, <laughs> from my arsehole, if you Share must Share if you dare. Yeah. Well, it, like I said, I, I, it was sort of rivers of black tar coming out of my arsehole, basically. That's what was happening. Okay. Yeah. And uh, quite a pungent uh, at that. Anyway, and I had a massive amount of internal bleeding. And when you bleed internally, higher up in the digestive tract, in the upper intestine and so on, it comes out black because the blood is digested. Mm. Long story short, the 10 days go by, all sorts of, uh, I'm getting weaker and weaker. And the problem with bleeding out, as I'm so sure you well know, is that when you bleed out the red blood cells, which transports the oxygen from the lungs to your cells, your hemoglobin 
that is also drained significantly. So you're supposed to have a red blood cell count. I think it's 13 to 16 as an adult male in the way they measure it in the UK. Mm -hmm. People start dying around seven. When I got to the hospital, the ER, about 10 days later, I was at four. So I was sitting on the hospital bed and I looked at my brother who I, I was living with at the time he was sharing the apartment with me, stepping outside to call my family to tell them what was going on. And I heard the doctor say to him, don't go he's probably not going to make it. Wow. And in that moment, it was almost as if everything switched off. Like when you pull the cord on an old TV, you know, those CRT TVs, the whole thing mm -hmm. goes, I remember. powers down, everything powered down in a sort of way. <laughs> and then suddenly, just as suddenly, everything came back online again. But things were mm. very different. Mm. Things were very different. And I sat there, I looked down at my body and I looked down at, and I could experience my body, and I experienced very clearly my body's, if you want, will to live. Mm. I experienced that the body was going to keep on living until it could no longer live. It was going to keep pumping and circulating until it was out of life entirely. And that wasn't really a question. And then I experienced, in a certain sense, my mind. And I realized that my mind was going to keep on attempting to live until it couldn't, using all of my cunning all of my determination, all of my brain power, if you want, to try to hang on to life until there was just simply no more strength to do so. Wow. But the funny thing about that, so that's sort of will to live, but the funny thing about that was that the stakes, in other words, it didn't matter to me in another way whether I was successful. Mm. It was the nature of my body to continue, the nature mm. of my body to continue. And if it worked, if I was able to continue, good. If not, fine. So there was this tremendous, if you want, facing of that that was very interesting. And I looked up at the uh, <laughs> look at, looked up at the curtains in the hospital room, and I was like, "Whoa, the curtains are kind of like me, or hmm. at least they're no less me than my bind and my body and so on and so forth." Anyway, so I didn't die. They did sort of emergency transfusions and so on, and that was, I think, quite a a watershed moment for me for a number of reasons, looking at myself and realizing that in some sense, I was a collection, a bundle of mm. momentum, mm. a bundle of habits, a bundle of biological forward momentum that was going to keep on doing its thing until the pattern ran out of energy and unraveled in a certain sense. So there's much more to that to that story. Yeah. One other interesting thing, I suppose, in the week that followed when I was in the hospital, they were pumping me full of all sorts of drugs. They didn't know exactly why it had all this internal bleeding. And the particular cocktail of drugs they had, uh, and of course, my being on the edge of, you know, uh, being very sick, I was sort of swimming in this, what I can only say is despair. I was laying in the hospital, mm. not really with it, not really fully compass mentis in this sort of despair. And usually if I'm having a hard time, you know, I say to myself, well, at least it's not, you know, I think of somebody who's having a worse time than me, you know, somewhere and somewhere. Right. But that very faculty of reframing my experience was itself soaked with despair. Everywhere I looked, the ground just kept falling out from under me. And if I thought about the past when I was healthy and when I wasn't suffering like this, it was oh, so unbearable. If I thought about the future and the uncertainty, mm. what will happen? Will I live? Will I die? Will I make it through? What would mm. my life be like? It was awful. And so all I could do was a sort of mantra came to me, a kind of phrase came to me, now I'm okay, now I'm okay. In other mm. words, if I just paid attention to the raw mm. sensations of the despair and discomfort, mm. I found something very interesting. I was sort of squeezed from the past and the future by the intensity of how unpleasant it was. Mm. And if I just paid attention, I was sort of forced to pay attention to exactly what was going on right then. Then I found that the... Mm those sensations lost their problem. They lost their sting and mm -hmm. they just became a sort of an oceanic wave of, of sensation that I was riding on in a certain sense and melted into in a certain way. And it was okay. So my solution to that, you yeah. could say, was to simmer like a sausage in a pan in the despair, mm -hmm. in the confusion, uncertainty and pain. And actually, then it was okay. So that got burned into my circuits. The, you know, the, a few of those lessons there that I've just outlined got burned into my circuits at that time because of the intensity and was quite, I'd say, a watershed for me. Wow. So, you know, so many of us have to read the book, The Power of Now, to even just intellectually approach 
the power of now, but I love how you language that. I was squeezed out of the future and the past. Yeah. There was nowhere for you to go. That was an immensely painful other than to just simmer, mm. as you said, in what was happening in the moment. And Yes. So how does that lesson, how has that showed up since then? I mean, because I had a near-death experience, not quite as dramatic as that, but mm. a car accident you know, should have been a splotch on a semi trailer, you know, 16 wheeler trucks windshield. We Gosh. crossed them, crossed into oncoming traffic on a highway and just squirted right in between these two trucks. And it was incredibly <sighs> clarifying that moment uh, mm. in my life. But, you know, the lesson was profound for a while. And then, you know, some, it fades to some degree and I can draw on it. But I'm curious, how has that continued to inform? your life since then? Well, I mean, I'll be honest with you, the repercussions were quite comprehensive mm. in the sense that there wasn't really an area of my life that was left untouched. I can summarize, mm. but there wasn't really an area of my life yeah. left, left untouched. In the next two or three years, mm. it was sort of walking around and noticing mm. that my responses to situations were very different. A couple of the things that I noticed, a lot of the activity of the mind and the personality is, I think, an attempt to reassure itself that it's there. Mm. So a little bit like people with mental problems sometimes do self-referencing touch. So you see them rocking and touching mm. themselves and so on to sort of reassure themselves that they're there to feel something solid. And a lot of the activity of the personality mm. of the mind, the way we interact with each other, the way we go about relationships and so on, is a sort of a sonar we're feeling constantly pinging the outside, pinging the outside, so as to feel mm. ourselves in relationship to that. So a lot of that activity went away. And the personality and, and all these things still the same, basically the same, still the same guy, but the frantic self-referencing of the mind went away. So what does that mean in practice? It means a lot less thinking, a lot less ruminating, those are the initial things. And also a lot less of a sense of preciousness about preserving my sense of my identity. Mm -hmm. So I became much more flexible. Mm -hmm. You know, the, some of the images that I, you know, have when I think about, if you want my vision or my approach to things, I think about being on a sinking ship full of gold and throwing the gold overboard sort of a life vision in a way, throwing the gold overboard to whoever's there. Now, mm. it's not the best way to distribute the gold. It's not perhaps the way, the most perfect way that you'd want to distribute the gold, but you've got two choices. It's out or sunk. Mm. So there's, I suppose, a sense of impending doom <laughs> or impending, mm. Mm -hmm. impending death or something like this, which mm. means now is the time to mm. shovel the gold out of the sinking ship imperfect as the situation is and imperfect as I am. Yeah, another another image that I have there is of having a flag on a battlefield. You know, you sometimes see these images yeah. somehow of the soldiers got the flag and they've got to go and put the flag on the hill. And if they can put the flag on the hill, then that somehow means they've taken the hill. You know, <laughs> you're the military man, you can right. correct me on that. But that's the image anyway. And so no. there's a sense of getting that flag as far forward as I can while it's in my hand. I'm planting it as far forward as I can before the bullets hit and probably from behind. You know, it's been my experience that very often the uh, the bullets mm. that take you out are the ones that come from your own lines, you know. But mm. that sense of we don't get out of here alive, we don't get out of here in one piece, we're going to pick up a lot of dents. So press on yeah. in the face of that and not to be intimidated by it. And in giving the gold, even as the ship's sinking, what I'm hearing you say is it, it's really there's an awareness that this ship is sinking. This is coming to an end. Yeah. It's probably going to be sooner than I expect it to be. And so let's offload the gold that I've got. Yes, it's always sinking. Mm. It's always sinking. Okay. It's always finished. The very mm. thing that just happened is done. Mm. This, you know, I don't know how many breaths I have, but I have about three or four less since I started this conversation. Right. There's a sense in which time is constantly pulling the rug out from under us. So why not love? Mm. Why not risk? Why not give? Mm. Uh, why not explore? Uh, why not uh, do what one can do while the thing is falling down, you know? And so I think that also helps one 
strive, even when the conditions aren't perfect, even when you're subject to yeah. unfairness, persecution, or just plain old unpleasant circumstances. Yeah. Well, yep, the ship is sinking. Yep, it's just a flesh wound, sir. <laughs> and you just keep keep on going because what else is there to do? What else is there to do? You know, it sounds so much like intimate relationship. And I know I work with couples. I've learned so much from you and from your, your co-teacher, Michaela, relational dynamics and practices. And, you know, in fact, it's one of the first things, actually, it is the first thing I ever heard out of your mouth were the words, it won't work. It won't work. Those are the first words I heard out of your mouth in response to a question I had asked. That question was, uh, I was at your workshop many years ago. I wanted to learn, you know, Michaela had asked, what are you guys here to learn this weekend? And I said something like, I want to help men. See, I- I've spent a lifetime making women angry with the best of intentions. <laughs> and I asked her, I said, well, I want to learn practices, techniques, like how can I help men? I don't remember exactly the question I asked, but it was something to this effect. How can I help men really, you know, show up in relationship more and love more so that we don't make women mad all the time so much? And it wasn't that exactly, but it was something along those lines. And Michaela looked at you and you had been very quiet sitting there in your your meditative knee stance, which I I have mad respect for. I don't know how you sit still (laughs) so long like that. And... And she handed it off to you and you paused for a moment. It won't work. And you went into a a wonderful conversation, which was confronting and so well received at the same time about how we're never going to get there. Mm. This is obviously my interpretation of it, but we're never going to this imaginary place where all our problems are going to be solved and it's never going to, we're never going to get there. And I wonder, you know, given what you just said, you know, one of the questions that I wanted to explore with you is in intimate relationship, because I know that's something that certainly I, for a lifetime, have encountered and and I work with, with men and and with couples and and that same understanding that, yeah, we're going to suffer a lot of flesh wounds. We're never going to not be shot at in some degree, especially if we're really showing up fully and not running away. And, And so I'm curious... So it's a long preamble into what would you offer, you know, the man, whatever his sexual orientation, but the man who feels burdened by relationship, the man who feels, man, this stuff is just so hard. It's so difficult. She or he is never, never happy for long, or I can't do it right. Or, you know, what would you offer in in the space of that, that we could fit in this, you know, these few minutes, you know, what do you think a man needs to learn or know to really create a truly fulfilling, intimate relationship? Mm-hmm. Well, I think the first thing to say to somebody when they say something like that is, yes, relationship is a burden. Mm. Yes, it is. And yes, it is a restriction. And it is a yoke. <laughs> you know. mm. Actually, absolutely it is. And so, you know, I, I think to try to find a sweet spot whereby a relationship or relationships in general are, as you say, truly fulfilling it's, it's just tilting at windmills, really. Every relationship has a rub. All relationships have a rub, a downside, if you want, or uh, irritant, or a restrictive part. Every choice mm-hmm. has if everything you say yes to, you're saying no to a hundred other things by default. So every, in, in a, rela- mm-hmm. a relationship is just the same. Mm-hmm. And the reason why or the reason for the relationship has to be sufficient to endure the rub. And sometimes the rub can last a few years. You know, partner gets sick something like Mm. that could happen Mm. the reason why has to be sufficient to endure the rub basically the reason why you mean the reason why you're together yes you could say that or the reason why you're in the relationship yeah right as opposed to not being in it let's say or being in another one for instance right right if you're in a relationship to try to be fulfilled or to try to be happy then you will get that sometimes but not all the time you know, mm. And you could always wonder, well, maybe what about this one? Maybe this one would be better. <laughs> the grass looks greener <laughs> on the other side of the, of the tinder, right. you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. What if I swipe this one? Oh, yes, yeah, so I think the reason I, I see, why think, it has to I be I think sufficient. that's really profound. Steve, I want to just stop you there for just for a moment because I think you just said something really, really, really profound that I want to make sure every man listening to this hears. And this was something that you actually asked me in one of our coaching sessions earlier on when I was having some, I was, I was really at a crisis point in my own relationship. Yeah. And you had asked me, 
what is the purpose of your relationship? Yeah. And, you know, I hadn't really thought about that. I think I have, you know, sort of an, you know, an underlying awareness of why, you know, that I want to grow or, but, but I hadn't really articulated it. And, and, and even I know there's danger, even in that being the reason why you want to be in relationship, but um, what you just said, you know, if you're in relationship because you just want to be happy, you want to feel good and be happy. Well, you're going to get that sometimes. And sometimes you're just not. And if that's sort of the default reason you're in relationship, those times when you're just not, which is just the human condition, has nothing to do with your partner, really. It's the human condition. Sometimes it is, but yeah, not necessarily. (laughs) You're going to question whether or not you should be in that relationship. Not necessarily. Yes. I appreciate that. But nonetheless, it's sort of the default anyway, human condition, it would seem. And you're going to question then whether you should be in this relationship if that's the reason you're in it. That's right. So I just wanted to highlight that because I think what you just said is really, really important to emphasize for the men and, pro- and probably a lot of women too listening. So I'm sorry, please continue. Yes, a, a lot of us, well, our assumptions about relationships will guide a large part of our behavior, whether we're aware of those assumptions or not. A lot of our assumptions aren't examined. It's assumed you should be in a relationship. But why? There's lots of good reasons to be in a relationship, but why? And sometimes it's for all sorts of very strange reasons. Well, I, I'm afraid to be alone or, you know, you're driven by a certain erotic yearning, something like that, or some other combination. And sometimes it's possible to, in a sense, be steered into relationship situations, steered into compromising situations because of how you feel at the moment that you make the compromise or at the moment when you get together with this person or whatever is the case. Yeah. Uh, we're steered sometimes by these unconscious drivers. Mm-hmm. And we make decisions that are not necessarily in our best interest. We lose sight of the big picture. We lose sight of where it is we'd like to be heading, what sort of a life we'd like to live, what sort of people we can sustain being, and so on. It's possible to, in attempting to make your partner happy, totally destroy your relationship. Mm-hmm. It's possible in the in the chase mm-hmm. to find a partner, because, well, of course you, you should have one. Then you... Get yourself into a really unpleasant situation, essentially. So it's very important to notice why are you doing what you're doing? And for that, of course, you need to be able to feel. You need to be able to feel your Mm. the sensations of your body. You need to be able to feel your emotions. You need to be able to put a little bit of a gap between stimulus and response, between the feeling inside and the action that comes afterwards. And a lot of the work that I do in workshops and one-on-one and so on, as you know, is about reconnecting people to that ability to feel what's actually happening, feel what's actually happening. Mm. And from that place of feeling what's actually happening, you can make much better decisions. But very often we collapse those two things, feeling what's happening and then responding to what we feel. We collapse them into the same step and we just shoot from the hip in a certain sense. Mm. But feeling what's happening, what is my body feeling? You don't have to name necessarily what the body's feeling, but being able to touch or taste the raw sensory data as you're sitting here right now, for instance, we can use the body as a perfect example. You can feel the sensations that reveal the presence of your body. And that's very specifically worded. Feel the sensations that reveal the presence of your body. Because there's two things going on. There's the raw sensory data flowing in that reveals the sensations of your body. And there's the mind labeling and categorizing. You can feel your bottom on the chair. Maybe you can feel your clothing on your skin. And the mind's labeling and categorizing that inflow as bottom on chair, clothing on skin. And can you tune in? Even as the mind labels and categorizes, you don't need to stop it from doing that. But can you also tune into the raw sensory data before it becomes bottom on chair or clothing on skin? If you knew nothing about bottoms and chairs and clothing and skin, what can you actually feel? And that ability to, in a sense, turn towards the situation to assess the situation, to survey the the terrain is very much more informative when it comes to making a better decision. And sometimes, you know, what feels right to do, as soon as you examine the motivations underneath, whew, suddenly the opposite course of action is much more sensible. Mm. I'm glad you uh, pivoted us into this, the somatic nature of your work, mm-hmm. because that's something that, you know, I was in the military I grew up on the East Coast of the U.S. I didn't grow up in California. I do feelings out here a lot. Yeah. I grew up on the East Coast and again military service. And I was really 
in many ways, intentionally by culture and by training, disconnected from my body yeah. to ignore what's happening in my body for the sake of outcome, right? For the sake of some predetermined desired outcome. And you used a really wonderful word early in this conversation, momentum. Uh-huh. And so I've found, especially I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a little over three years into an extraordinary intimate relationship with just an exquisite woman. And yet that inability, I won't say inability, but that lack of practice or the momentum in the direction of not feeling my body yeah. and not trusting or not even paying attention to the sensations in my body. That's one of the things I've loved about working with you and doing your work and, you know, spending that, th- we did that three day men's workshop where all we did was these really gentle, they weren't harsh sort of body practices that you might normally associate, especially in men's work. So again, can you deepen in that a little bit? Cause I know this is so, so important. And I want to make sure that, that the men listening really get why this matters. Yeah. You said something about being able to feel your body as a sort of a foundation for making, I'll just use the word better. I don't mm-hmm. know if that's the right word, but you know, better choices. Can you just deepen in that a little bit for us? I mean, even let's say professionally, you know, not just in an intimate relationship, but you know, that kind of ties into that question. How do you decide what to say yes to versus what to say no to, for example? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll try to draw some of that together. I mean, you're right. It's such a a tricky area and it's laden with as you say, the kind of West Coast touchy-feely stuff. And it's so yeah. possible to drown in navel-gazing, to drown in feelings and so on. <laughs> and and it happens to people, you know, some people, and, and actually I think overriding the body for the sake of a, an objective is a tremendous skill to have and s- extremely important, mm. extremely important. Mm. There are many situations where you have to just do it and your body says, I don't want to do it. <laughs> I want to stay in bed or mm. whatever it is. I don't want to run up that hill. <laughs> right. and, you, and you have to yeah. do it. And that's the yeah. end of that. So it's an enormous <laughs> gift, I think, to be able to do that. But I talk about bringing the body to the table of advisors. So if you sort of imagine in your mind, inside of you, you know, there's this, a sort of round table like King Arthur and the, and the round table. And there are different mm-hmm. people on this table. There's your past experiences. Uh, there's your what you've seen, you know, you've got your sort of representative for the societal lessons inculcated in you from childhood. You know, you've got Mm -hmm. your capacity for imagination and creativity who sat right next to your capacity to imagine the worst possible outcome and so on. Anyway, you've got all these parts of yourself in a certain way that your ability to to think into the future, your ability to weigh different options, whatever, your ability to delay gratification, all these important aspects. And they're around there sort of, if you want, feeding into this decision-making process to this navigation process that's a part of being human being. And to bring the body to the board of advisors is very, very good, which means to be able to feel the sensations of the body physically, because there's a lot of information there. The brain is spread right the way through the nervous system. So there's lots of information there, subtle information that we can add. So we're getting basically better quality data, we're getting more data, different sorts of data, another angle on the situation. You can get that from, from the body. And of course, similarly with the emotions. If you don't bring the emotions, if you want, to the board of advisors, which just means being in contact with it, it just means giving it a voice, then it's going to be sort of like a counter-revolutionary force <laughs> under the, from the neck down. Yeah. And everything's fine, everything's fine, everything's fine. And then suddenly, in a sort of a Game of Thrones moment, everything's not fine. And you're angry, <laughs> or you're depressed, or you're anxious, uh, and you don't know where, it, where on earth it came from. Everything was fine, yeah. but it, actually, there were all sorts of sensations mm. going on there beneath the neck that you didn't realize. Yeah. So to be able to catch that early and to bring it on board. Now, of course, as you say, what happens to some people is they end up, it's a developmental phase, I think, with the dictatorship of the body. In other words, they begin to feel the body or their emotions for the first time and they realize, oh, I've got feelings and oh my gosh, you know, I've got a body. And it sort of becomes this sort of dictatorship where everything yeah. has to be pressed and signed off by the body and I don't do anything unless I don't get out of bed in the morning unless my body says so. And I, I have to have my green juice, otherwise I'm you know, going to be a total nightmare to everybody. And this is the sort of, you see that sometimes, in, as you say, in California and other places too. And that's not good. 
it's a developmental phase, you know. Yeah. But to integrate the body there, it's very, very, very smart. And also the thing about the body is that it's there's a richness of experience there. There's a richness of living and sensation that is yeah. in the body. There's very often an intrinsic pleasantness in the taste of feeling mm. the body uh, and so yeah. on. So in other words, you don't only open yourself to negative emotions or feelings of fatigue and pain. You, When you widen your feeling capacity, you also open yourself to subtle flavors of bliss, joy, happiness, gratitude, and so on. So I sometimes also say that there's no informed consent on intimacy. There's no informed mm. consent on feeling. I just define intimacy mm. as feeling, basically, feeling the sensations that are there to be felt. And so if you're going to look and feel what the body, what's going on in the body, you're going to see what's there. You're going to feel what's there. It might be pleasant, might be unpleasant. In a certain sense, you're opening yourself to any possible sensation and feeling there. Um, so there's something, I think, about, about that that is tremendously enlivening and, uh, yeah, and also contributes to your navigation quite a bit. Yeah. As you're you're sharing that the enjoyment, there's so much richness in that experience, and I'm I'm recalling a meditation I did until actually you know I would say until you and also Lauren Roche you know in the last mm-hmm. few years you and Lauren Roche and Lauren is also going to be on on this podcast. Cool. You two men really shifted my experience of meditation in a very beautiful way that I'm so grateful for, and um you know. He, Meditation always felt like such a tyranny to me. Yeah. And, you know, years ago, you know, my, my favorite meditation was just to cook in the kitchen without speaking a word, just do it in silence, but hearing every feeling, every experience, hearing everything, the, the, the suctioning of the refrigerator door opening and closing the you know, the, the tinkling of the, of the silverware in the drawer when I pulled it open and the, you know, all the steam coming out of the pot, all of that such a, a rich experience, but I couldn't just couldn't bring myself to just sit in a spot and not move or try to, you know, quiet my thoughts or just focus on my breath or it just, it just occurred to me as such a tyranny. And I didn't really have that insight until starting to do your work. And it's one of the things that, you know, and, I, and I've begun to incorporate that and share that with other men also. Um, you know, I sat with you in in that men's uh, weekend, and we meditated. We did a one meditation for one hour without moving. That was never something that I would have ever even wanted to try. <laughs> and of course, you didn't tell us it was going to be an hour. Hmm. I'm sneaking, like which that. probably made it feel longer or short. I can't remember, but but the instruction that you gave. I don't remember the exact language, but I remember, I mean, the whole weekend was essentially what I took from it was that meditation is, you, know, you use the word softness a lot. And again, your languaging seems to be really powerful, focused on the sensations that reveal the presence of your body. Mm. It's like being invited without using the word, I invite you, mm. you know? And that's something that has really served me. And, and as I've shared that with other men, those kinds of practices have been really transformative for me and really opened up meditation. And there's something profound in that, mm-hmm. Steve. And because it seems very paradoxical. Yes, sometimes I, you're right. There are moments where it does require me to override what's happening in my body, yeah. which feels like a kind of tyranny. And yet, oh, some of my just most releasing, relaxing enjoyable moments, even with my partner, when she's in the room present and we're interacting is an experience of softness and relaxing and, and uh, allowing what is to be. So I'm wondering, I'm not even sure quite what the question is. I just know that there's something profound here. And I wonder if you could, Mm. how did you wake up to that? Where did you learn that? How did you soften your own kind of masculine, I don't know if that's the, you know, but so that, that masculine psychology of, ah, we have to, you know, dominate and conquer everything, including the body. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot there. I'm very pleased to hear 
what you said there about your experience meditating mm -hmm. with me in that in in that workshop that really is wonderful to think that you, you said it's opened up meditation to you that that really is very oh yeah really is very nice yeah meditation there are many different approaches many different techniques i don't see spirit and matter as fundamentally separate so i think the greatest tribute or the greatest meditation tribute you can offer <laughs> god or your experience is your attention and your full participation in life so sometimes meditation is done as a way of getting somewhere else and there's a sense in which it is that and there's an aspect of meditation that requires you to open to what you're feeling what you can detect and by feeling i don't mean necessarily on the emotions i mean sensory experience what you can see what you can hear what you can taste what you feel in your body inside and out the thoughts and so on in your mind Meditation is, is a way of, bear in mind, like I said, there's, there's many different approaches, but meditation, as I think of it, is it's right at your fingertips the whole time. Your sensory experience is the portal, it's the ground, it's the destination, and there's so much, in a certain sense, it's right there, so close to your face. So when I'm teaching meditation or introducing people to meditation, I emphasize the availability of meditation to them, to their natural experience, I would say, which is difficult to sell. <laughs> it's, yeah. easy, it's easier to sell, it's, you know, but it's yeah. very wonderful. It's, mm, yeah, so that's right. An availability of meditation yeah. to your natural experience, the taste of the taste of that is right there. And when people cotton onto that, it's wonderful because it's there for them all the time. And there's lots of cultivation, there's lots of development. But as your point about softening the, as you're saying, the sort of conquering, uh, pressing forward and so on, mm -hmm. that I think it's very much the same sort of energy in a way to turn towards and to soften and look the thing in the face, to look experience in the face, to look the taste of experience in the face is enormously courageous and bold. It's a real leap yeah. into the dark because you don't know what you're going to find. And mm. there is that saying, when you look into mm. the abyss, the abyss looks back into you. <laughs> and it's true. When you start to <laughs> uh -huh. penetrate into the nature of sensory experience, the the penetration goes both ways mm. and one cannot survive that without being radically changed but perhaps this is a little abstract and you know yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it, i can I'm, tell you I'm, one I'm experience well I'm, I'm i'm reminded tell us that experience but I'm, I'm reminded of the joseph campbell said something that really reframed my experience of living mm. for me because I was always so preoccupied with the search for the meaning of life. Why are we here? Right. What's this all about? What's the ultimate truth? And, you know, the answer eluded me as it does still. And yet, Joseph, he said something. It was in an interview, I think. Well, I can't remember with who, but he said, I don't really think people are looking for the meaning of life so much as we are looking for the experience of being alive. So as you're sharing you know, what that meditative, what you and, and Lauren as well, and, and some other mentors in their own ways have you know, opened up for me is the relaxing of my intellectual pursuit of understanding everything and more of a deepening in my feeling the aliveness in, in my body, in the moment. And you know, even as you were talking... I was starting to notice you were saying meditation is at your fingertips. And that's yeah. one thing that I've often taught people because it's been my practice as well, other than just sitting still is, is you know, standing in line at Starbucks. What a, what a profound moment to meditate, to just be aware. And it's like my kitchen meditation. And as you were talking, it's like I started to notice the sweat in my hands and timber of both our voices and and it really, the moment, you know, the moment, but oh, I felt an aliveness that when I get so-called lost in my head, I tend to lose sight of. And that has real impact. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Yeah. It's, it's right on the fingertips. It's at the tip of the tongue. And to me, it's very thrilling. And to me, I get a real squirt of that kind of you know what I imagine bass jumpers feel or something like this you know it's a real mm. it is a real thrill there's nothing 
yeah. passive about it fundamentally. It's enormously energizing and enormously enlivening, like a very, very, very strong cup of coffee. <laughs> you know, yeah. the breath catches in, in the throat and it's happening now, you know, because it's churning and it's going on. Mm. You know, you're, you're describing something so you know, this edge and I don't know, men's work or kind of men's circles or, you know, we talk about, you know, being on the edge of experience. And I do believe, and I've experienced this in my own life. Like I, I really need to feel challenged in my life yeah. somewhere to hold my attention, to make things interesting. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, in, in a sports competition, the most boring sports competition is one where one team is blowing out the other. Mm -hmm. And yet if it's a close score, it almost doesn't matter who's playing. We're thrilled in the this challenge that we're witnessing. And, but I describe this as, you know, as a man at the, the edge where I describe it, where inspiration, creativity, and ambition meet the risk of complete failure. And so you're talking about this in a really interesting way, because I wanted to actually ask you, you know, what does your edge look like now mm. in your life? Like where are you constantly challenging yourself in a way to, to keep showing up in the face of potential failure? Yeah. Uh, you're bringing a lot of interesting points there. And, and yeah. one of the problems with this term edge is I think it's a problem of temporal perspective. And what do I mean by that? As you say, it's a word that's very fetishized in self-development culture men's workshops and so on go to your edge feel the edge that sort of thing as if having a state experience of the edge of your capacity is the same as exploring a, a new frontier and growing and developing in other words you can aim towards a state experience of being on the edge or you can choose to explore new territory what the edge when you ask me what's my edge and i can tell you a couple of a very personal mm -hmm. example happily it's the frontier of exploration if you want it's the part where the lips of my curiosity are touching or brushing against the skin of i don't know what yet <laughs> because it's unknown you know mm. that first touch mm -hmm. or that new area it's the area where i'm sizzling in confusion like a sausage in a pan mm. but not for the sake of feeling like i'm on on my edge like a sort of a edge junkie and a lot of these workshops that you're hinting at there, people are thrust into a high state experience to give them the illusion of having made some progress. Wow, that was really intense. I must have really made some progress there. Whereas real progress is not always such a high intensity affair. It's, for instance, in the body. If you push your body to its edge every single workout, it'll break down. Right. If you're attempting to increase your flexibility and you're pushing yourself to your edge as far as you can go, you're going to trigger the anti-stretch reflex. You're going to, which basically the body will brace against your attempt to stretch it out. The body will rebel against being pushed and bullied and so on. So if you really want to explore the edge of the unknown and push the edge, as the phrase goes into those frontiers, you need patience, you need gentleness, you need sensitivity. You need to be able to feel what's going on, to use the example of stretching, you know, as a prosaic example. You need to be able to feel what's going on there. You need to be able to be present with the sensations in, let's say, the back of your legs, your hamstrings, as you're stretching. Mm. Because it's not simply a case of, of push, 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 push. It doesn't work. It doesn't work like that. So unfortunately, these things require an attention and an awakeness in the process. You can't shortcut it by just throwing some weight behind it. You can't shortcut it or bypass the need to get to know the confusion, to simmer in the state of confusion. You can't bypass that by just using raw aggression. There has to be sensitivity. There has to be nuance. And that is the same if you're a hunter or if you're a fighter or something like that. In those, in those situations, you have to use sensitivity, gentleness, awareness, as well as ruthlessness. In fact, the real ruthlessness, the real effectiveness incorporates those softer elements because they help to really uh, produce the result you know, that you're looking for, whatever the case may be. Does that all make sense when I said there? <laughs> uh, absolutely. I think especially in the, I like that you use that hunter 
example yeah. at the end, because it is very paradoxical. And I think yeah. that that's something that men, we really, really, really struggle with in our tendency to be loyal to logic, which defies paradox. And yet, and that's what, again, about your work that I, I'm, I'm so nourished by is it very much is, it is a, a paradoxical kind of merging of, you said like kind of ruthless softness. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yin and yang, isn't it? In a way. It's an emerging of both. Yeah, it's a merging of both it's, uh, natural and naturalness, or whatever the, you know, as Bruce Lee would say. Yeah, but as you asked, an edge of mine, as you know, I'm a very keen meditator. It's one of the things that I enjoy doing a lot. And we're in the sort of mystical, meditational topics today, and that's fine. There's there's much more, of course, but that's a good place to be. It's one of my favorite places. And yeah. you know, in my meditation practice at the moment, one of the things that I'm really discovering is with an increase in attentional skill which is a consequence of meditation naturally, you, you're able to, when people first sit down to meditate, typically one realizes, gosh, I'm so distracted all the time. I didn't realize I was so distracted until I tried to concentrate on something. Or, you know, you sit down, your mind's going everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that's a bit of a cliche to say that. That's what they'll say, tell you in meditation class 101, you know. Oh my gosh, my mind is so distracted. And of course, when you realize you're distracted, you're not distracted actually. Uh, what happens is you're sitting there and then suddenly you black out essentially. And then you kind of, re-emerge like getting wiped out in a surfboard you sort of re-emerge moments minutes days later and you think oh wow i was totally thinking about something else or i was totally doing something else and i didn't even realize i was doing it so in that moment when you realize you're distracted you're no longer distracted it's actually a, a profound moment of awakeness actually when you go oh how distracted am i well right then not so much and you can ride that awakeness back in but then gradually of course your distractibility or your indistractability, let's put it that way, increases. It takes more and more turbulence or a stronger impetus to throw you into distraction, a more compelling thought to draw you in or a more unpleasant sensation to make you turn away. Uh, you, you're not as easy to throw off the horse if you want uh, or the bucking bronco as it sometimes feels like. So then what happens there is you're present for a set of material or sensations that you previously were would have been distracted for because now your threshold for what it takes to distract you has increased. So now you're going to be there for that. And that can be quite interesting, quite a revelation to realize just what's going on here. And I, I was quite surprised to realize that a lot of my nose scratches when I just sort of mindlessly scratch my nose when I meditate, mm. it was coming from a sort of erotic uprising in the body. I'd be sitting there and mm. And I didn't notice it, of course, because I just find myself scratching my nose, you know. But then as my concentration improved, I started to notice, oh, you start to kind of hear it coming. You sort of see things coming. You think, oh, something's coming. Interesting. Something's coming. And then, oh, no, I'm scratching my nose. And then as the days and the weeks and the months go by, you start to say, ah, you can see it coming and you can stay on the horse of attention, stay on the horse, whatever your technique is, feeling the body sensations maybe and experience what previously would have thrown you into distraction. You can experience it without losing consciousness, basically, without losing the attention. And that's a continual revelation, I think. And so one of the things that lately for me in my practice, and I'm on the boat here, and whenever I'm on the boat, I do lots and lots of practice, it's to experience the degree to which I'm craving and aversion are so present. I think I want to call a friend, you know, because I want to talk to them. Mm. Oh no, actually, underneath there's loneliness, mm. there's agitation, there's sensual, maybe even erotic aliveness that's almost unbearable to feel. So rather than feel mm. the loneliness and the aliveness and whatever might be going on down there, I'll just uh, drink a beer or I'll just call a friend mm. or I'll just watch a YouTube video or read a book, you know, or something like that. Mm. And so for me at the moment, I've dropped into a, a deeper layer of the extent to which these unconscious forces are driving certain actions. And it's so beautiful because when you keep a bead on that, without losing your consciousness, without losing, if you want, awareness. And it actually comes by relaxing, it comes, not by tensing. You relax, 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 widen, widen, widening. Mm. And then you start to, to feel these things. They sort of aspirate, They're like an air freshener. They break up in a certain way. And they, and they become, if you want, labelless uh, energy sort of feeling. So anyway, it's, it's difficult for me to describe it exactly because as you yeah. pointed out, it is something of a new frontier or a new, a deeper frontier of, yeah. of an old, of an old exploration. So it's so wonderful. And what's the consequence of that? Freedom. 
Mm. freedom, maneuverability, less driven, more maneuverability, a better ability to choose an action that's not, shall we say, so automatic, Mm. something like that, a loosening of the habit patterns of the scanders, you could say, Mm. which those cracks produced by that, light can flow, uh, insight can come, freedom, compassion, compassion oozes out of those cracks very often softening of the heart which is an extremely powerful thing to have mm. an awake heart very powerful so these sorts of things i'd say this is somewhat uh, an edge in my practice at the moment beautiful thank you <laughs> we're going to move to the finale now the, the the five key takeaways finale what's important to me in this podcast too is that men leave with Things that they can walk away with, because I mean, we've covered already. We've we've covered some really beautiful ground, and and yeah. there's so much depth and richness. And this could be a 20 hour podcast, yeah. and we'd still just be beginning. But I want to try to give men just these five key takeaways. If they take nothing else, mm-hmm. five things that are actionable, that are practical, that they can begin to work with immediately after listening. So Mm -hmm. call this the five key takeaways finale. And the first one, key insight. What's the one key insight that you would offer listeners that you believe can make a meaningful impact on their lives because it has in yours? Find your own insight. And get off my lawn while you're at it. (laughs) (laughs) What do I mean? Secondhand (laughs) insights. As reassuring as it is to hear somebody opinionate about all the insights that they may or may not have themselves, or they may or may not have read somewhere and borrowed from someone else, it's secondhand gossip. Yeah. You have to find your own insights. You have to discover your own frontiers, make your own distinctions. Don't rely on the distinctions of another person. I love it. You may have just blown that one out of the running in these five key takeaways, because if Every man I interview, the wisdom of every man says, find your own insight. Oh, damn. Well, that renders that they were wonderful they were and pointless all at the same time. Back to paradox. I'd be very interested what people say there. I think there's many good ways to answer that question, not just that way. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Thank you. Okay, number two, key mentor. Name another man that you've been inspired by, living mm-hmm. or dead, that you would recommend the men listening to learn more about. Bruce Lee. Mm. Bruce Lee. I was a total nutcase about Bruce Lee when I was a little boy. He was a ruthless guy, you know, very ruthless fighting. But he also was saying to be soft like water yes, and this sort of thing. Well, why does being soft like water have to do with being ruthless and being, you know, strong and being effective and powerful? Well, actually, read some Bruce Lee and you'll, and you'll find out the marriage of hard and soft. Plus, he overcame many, many difficult obstacles. The deck was stacked against him in many ways, beyond his control, and he didn't let it stop him. He kept going. He had his vision. He had his dream, and he developed credible expertise, and he pressed his case in the world, despite the obstacles, despite the unfairness, despite the oppression, despite all these sorts of things. He still made a go of it. So he would be a tremendous guide. You can look up his book, The Tao of Jeet Kune Do, which is more philosophical. Uh, but mm. the end of his writings are, I think, very inspirational. Cool. Bruce Lee, wonderful. Soft like water. Number three, key resource. Your most impactful, inspiring book, movie, or podcast of the last year. Mm-hmm. My co-teacher, Michaela Bohem, just published a book with Simon & Schuster called A Wild Woman's Way. It's a book, technically or ostensibly for women, but it's actually good advice for women. <laughs> Rather, it's not a book that mm. weaponizes women's dissatisfaction for profit. And it's not a book that mm. plays on entitlement and these sorts of things in order to sell books, sell seeds, get people all whipped up into a frenzy and so on. It's a really good advice for women. And Michaela really knows her stuff. So I think it's a great voice of reason and a voice of experience and a constructive voice in a sphere, which is advice in general and advice for women in specific, which is full of such bullshit. Mm. So get The Wild Woman's Way. If you're a man, it's a good book to read, to learn some healthy perspectives from that side of the fence if you want. 
the the wild woman's way. And and Michaela is another teacher that I've I've studied with a lot and got such a mad respect for her work. It's been so, so, so transformative and helpful for me, even in my work as a a teacher and a coach as well. I'm so grateful. So wonderful. Thank you. Number four, key investment. In the last year, what's the best thing that you spent money on? And we'll say under $10,000. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I'd say education. One of my newer pursuits lately is I'm learning the Tibetan language. I've been studying that now for about, you know, a year, year and a half, something like that. And for, you know, for several reasons. But one of the reasons is I just like the sound of it. And I just think it's interesting. And it stimulates my brain in different ways than, mm. than it would otherwise. Am I ever going to need it? I don't know. If I, if I fall out of an airplane and I land in Tibet... I can certainly buy a cup of coffee and find an Airbnb. <laughs> so that's good. But uh, I'd say education, you know, and three times a week, my Tibetan language teacher, Sonam Chusang from LearnTibetan.net, you know, he talks to me and I pay him to be my friend. <laughs> mm. But it's great and it really stimulates me and it challenges me. And, I'm, you know, it's not a specialty of mine. And I think it's great to be, in the same way, I like to bake in confusion. I like to put myself in positions where I don't know what's going on. We become such specialists, so comfortable in our competency Mm. that it's so Mm. enriching to be in a position where one is not so comfortable, if you want. So I would say Tibetan language lessons. Lovely. Yeah, at uh, Tony Robbins events, anytime someone says, you know, with frustration, usually, I'm really confused. Mm. Everyone breaks out into applause and celebration. Oh, he's confused, everybody. Yay. You know, it means that you're about to learn something new. Yeah. Finally, key practice. Steve, would you please offer one practice, spiritual, creative, personal, relational, just one practice that has served you well or served the men that you've worked with well and that you would invite or challenge the men listening to take on for just the next seven days? Yes. I would say to set a timer for five minutes, you know, seeing as we've been talking about meditation, and to tune into the raw sensory data. In other words, and let's, why not start with the body? You can use any sense gate. You can use what you see. You can use what you hear. But why not start with the body? You sit there and you just feel the sensations of the body. As if you knew nothing about bodies, what could you feel? We sort of assume our body's there because we're used to it being there. It was there the last time you checked. But... If you tune into the raw sensory data, then you're, you're basically continually a fresh feeling. feeling. So as I sit here, I can feel my foot on my other foot. I can feel my bottom on the chair. And these are labels. So I want to go a little bit beyond the labels, even as the labels are going on, no need to stop them. And just feel the raw, tingly, ever-changing, churning sensation. So I would recommend this raw sensation. I talked earlier about immanence and transcendence, the idea that spirit and matter are one and and you know God is God is here. And so I like to think of this raw sensory data practice as stripping God of concepts, of labels, and looking God, if you want, naked in the flesh. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Steve, your your name is the Guru Viking. You're I don't know if you call it a nickname or I love it. I'm a huge fan of just Viking culture. I watch the Vikings show on the History Channel. And I recommend every man watch that show. It's so enjoyable. Probably my favorite all time. Where can people yeah. learn more about you? Well, the best place to find me is www.guruviking.com. Guru Viking, G-U-R-U, Viking, V-I-K-I-N-G.com. And there, there's all sorts of free audios, there's guided meditations, there are articles, there's lots of videos. I do travel vlogs and you can follow me going around the place and uh, doing hilarious things. Uh, And lots and lots of cool stuff on there, as well as all the workshops I'm teaching, as well as DVDs of the way my movement method, movement coin method, and downloads and so on. So there's plenty at guruviking.com. It has been an absolute honor to have you. I'm so grateful to you for this and, of course, everything else that you've gifted to me over the years. And I look forward to our interactions unfolding in the future. And um, it's been a a great honor. Thank you so much for saying yes to this. It's been a great pleasure, Brian. I think you do wonderful work and I'm very happy to know you. So thank you so much for having me on. 
Thank you so much for listening. And thank you again to Steve James. Go learn more about Steve at guruviking.com. Any links, resources, books, and Steve's five key takeaways from today will be in the show notes at brianreeves.com slash podcast. That is Brian with a Y, Reeves, R-E-E-V-E-S dot com slash podcast. And if you can think of anyone who might be served by what you just heard, please share this episode with them now. And to help more men benefit, as well as the mothers, sisters, children, lovers, and anyone else who loves men and is affected by men, which means pretty much everybody, to help them benefit from this too, please, right now, go to whatever app you're using to hear my voice and rate this podcast with as many stars and glowing words as you can muster so you too can lead more men this way. And don't forget to subscribe yourself while you're at it for more life insights from wise men. I'm your thriving life and relationship coach, Brian Reeves, Brian with the Y Reeves. Until soon, keep your head up, your breath relaxed, and your thoughts inspired. Thanks again for listening.